Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 623 of the podcast and it is Sunday the 15th of May 2022 as I record this. On today's show, I talk to Derek Sivers about what writing means to him, what true independence might be as a creative, and his tips on selling digital and print direct, as well as thoughts on AI and emerging technologies as tools for the writer. Many of you might have read Derek's book, Anything You Want, and heard his story of growing CD Baby, the first company to help musicians sell their music directly to fans, which he sold in 2008. Since then, he's focused on writing and living in different countries, and we have a wide-ranging discussion around what he thinks about writing, publishing and self-publishing, and selling direct these days. So that's coming up in the interview section. So not really much going on in publishing or book marketing news, but in my personal update, I am in hand edits of how to write a novel, which I'm actually really happy with. Wrangling the chaos into a book is always fun. I love the editing phase. I'm really happy with this bit, and I'm certain this will be useful, at least to some people. (laughs) I'm finding it interesting to explore my own creative process for fiction, and I am an intuitive discovery writer. So I think this book, my book, with my perspective as intuitive and discovery, will sit alongside many of the more linear plotting type craft books and offer a different view because I really do have a different view. And I've struggled for years trying to fit myself into the box of what other people say writing a novel should be. And much of it has never fit with me. So yeah, I think I'm finally ready to bring that out (laughs) in my own craft book. I've also decided not to do a Kickstarter. Uh, So thanks to Holly Wharton, whose recent podcast episode on how to know when you're putting too much pressure on yourself, (laughs) helped me make this decision. And uh, Holly's podcast is Into the Woods, and uh, I'll link to that in the show notes. Or you can just search for Holly Wharton, W-O-R-T-O-N, if you want to listen to Holly. Uh, Holly's been on the show before and also on Books and Travel and we've been sort of uh, friends for a while and I, I listened to her show and I was like, that's exactly right. I've been putting too much pressure on myself. And again, I'm, I need to trust my intuition around what's right for me. And I've been really feeling like this is not right for me. I don't like hypey spike launches. One of the reasons I love being in indie is because we don't have to do hypey spike launches. <laughs> and by ne- necessity, Kickstarters are about pushing your energy into, you know, one particular launch period. You have to promote them within this certain uh, period and then they're over. I much prefer evergreen promotions. I much prefer doing things in a more gentle manner. I've also been sick again. I got another head cold twice in a month, (laughs) neither of which was COVID. Uh, Again, surprise, there are lots of other viruses in the world other than COVID. Uh, I was in Arizona, I was traveling and uh, the dryness, I think, made a huge difference. My body does not like that dry. But um, yeah, so also I just think when you uh, get sick a number of times, then your body is probably telling you something. So Also, I wanted to mention Dan Ariely, who's like a behavioral um, scientist, um, behavioral social scientist, I guess. And he has this thing called cancel elation, which is if you don't know whether or not you want to do something, then think about this cancel elation. Would you be happy if it got (laughs) cancelled? And when I thought about should I just cancel this Kickstarter? I thought, oh, I'm I'm happy. I feel happy if I just cancelled it. So I was like, well, obviously that means I should. 
I'm really glad I investigated it fully and I really did. I have a project plan, a multi-page pro- project plan. I have a spreadsheet of cost things and um, I read books. Obviously, I interviewed Monica Lee now. I've got Brian Cohen coming on the show in the next month to give his tips and lessons learned from his recent Kickstarter. Thanks also to Guy Windsor, Kevin Partner and Connor Whiteley who gave me help with my plan. Uh, and I'm certainly not writing Kickstarter off for a future project. It's still something I might do, but not with this book and not this summer because it was it would have ended up being in the summer. I want to live more. I feel like I've been trying to cram in lots of living and lots of work post pandemic once things have opened up and I need to calm down a bit <laughs> and and think it's okay. We're we're hopefully well fingers crossed we won't go back into lockdown. They won't shut down the world again. I don't have to cram everything into this period. I need to clear the space for some more creative work. And uh Derek talks about this as well. We talk about towards the end around his next project and sort of leaving space for what comes next. So yes, I need to fill my creative well and I need to live more and I also need to work on the books that are bubbling away for me rather than force a project. I'm still reflecting on the Creator Economy Expo in Arizona, the CEX conference I went to and the changes I want to make. That will also take time and I didn't, I guess I allowed time for the conference but I didn't allow time for what might come out of the conference. (laughs) The Kickstarter was all sort of thought about before the conference, which now I'm rethinking what I want to do. I am doing a live event here in Bath on the 12th of June with my friend uh, Orna Ross from the Alliance of Independent Authors on the creator economy. And I'm starting to speak on this topic. So preparing that material is helping me think about what I want to do as well. It's always good if you want to think about something is to teach it because you have to get your thoughts in order. I'm also working on a solo episode for Books and Travel because it was going to Arizona after so long away from America made the USA feel very foreign to me. And because I was visiting regularly before the pandemic, I got really used to America. I know how it works. I've been going, you know, my mum moved to the USA. She moved to Oregon and then lived in San Diego. So I've been going to the USA since I was sort of 18. So yeah, 25 years (laughs) Oh, wait, 30 years. (laughs) Scary. Uh, But yes, so I feel like I know the culture and I know how things work. I've traveled a lot in the USA. But this time I really felt it was like a foreign land. And there were a lot of differences I noticed from here in Bath. You really couldn't get somewhere more different in many ways. So I want to do an episode on that because I'm back in Las Vegas in November. I have to cope with that dryness again. And uh, also, uh, where am I going? Colorado Springs in February for the Superstars of Writing Conference. Uh, So I want to write this all down before it disappears again in my brain. Because yeah, it's interesting when we've been away for a while, and then we go again, and we notice things that we forgot, basically. So also in futurist stuff, I did want to mention Google had their conference this week and uh, on AI translation, check out their video on breaking down language barriers with augmented reality. So this combines the AR side with AI, uh, AR being augmented reality and of course AI artificial intelligence and Google Translate is already is absolutely incredible, but they just added more languages, now has 133 languages, including a lot of languages that are spoken by few groups of people. So they're they're really trying to uh, protect a lot of languages as well. But this video is fascinating. It demonstrates their glasses. Now, I actually tried Google Glass when they came out years and years ago, over a decade ago. And of course, that was way too early. But this is really interesting. It's well worth watching the video. What happens is, say someone is in front of you and they're speaking Mandarin or Spanish or whatever, and you don't understand that language, you only speak English, uh, and uh, you, you're you wearing the glasses and you're looking at them and what uh, the transcription of what they're saying in English appears on the screen. So it's translating real time and giving you what they're saying in your language. So of course, if you speak Spanish and they, they're speaking English, it's going to show Spanish on your screen. So it's really well worth watching the video. Now, I use the app. Many of us, when we travel, use the Google Translate app. Of course, it it works for language, but not for cultural differences. 
Uh, but all, um, I mean, even years ago now, like four years ago, I was using that app to, if you hold an, hold the app, the camera up at a sign when you're traveling, it will translate the sign. So it, it, the translation of static text has been around for years now. And of course, their app, if you hold the app and you speak into the app, it can speak another language or can translate on the on the on the text on the screen this is this is now putting it into glasses fascinating now I obviously think about this as a writer and a while ago I posted on the blog how you can hold that translation app over a book so um, I held it up over one of my books one of my non-fiction books in French I held up the Google lens you know over the page and it and showed it in English. So it can already do that. Now, of course, there is an art to translating fiction in particular and some lyrical nonfiction, but the bulk of nonfiction books, the bulk of written material, the bulk of business material, news, I mean, there's so much where just translating the text is going to be fine with AI. Now, if you think about it, I was considering that the next iteration of apps, there might be an app that will translate books within the app. But now I think, well, maybe that will just be done with AR in glasses. So I will look at, if I'm reading a book with my AR glasses on, I will see it in my language rather than the language it's written in. Why not? Since you can already do that with the uh, app. So yeah, try it yourself. You can find a book on online in another language, hold up your Google app uh, and use the Google Lens or use Google Translate and you'll be able to see it in another language and then consider how much easier that will be to read in translation with AR glasses. So certainly interesting times for sure. And once again, like the AI narration, I'm not saying this is the end of translators either. It, it, it's, it's more like the 80-20 rule. The art of translation will not be lost, but maybe the brute force translation will be done by uh, AI. And of course, many translators already use DeepL.com. And in fact, Derek and I talk about DeepL.com in this um, interview. So interesting times. Say thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. We had so many. You loved the discussion with Angie Marsons. And yeah, lots of you very happy to listen to her accent. And as I said to her, I mean, I, I think this is the thing. In, in England, we have this this class system where certain ways of speaking are judged in certain ways. But around the world, people don't know about this. And I love Andy's accent. I think it was brilliant. So uh, lots of people left comments and tweets. I'll just read a couple of them. Madeline left a comment. She said, great interview. I'm a huge fan of the Kim Stone series. I believe the books just keep getting better and better. A pair of old slippers is right. I look forward to settling in with every book. I go old school, paperback in hand to see what Kim and her team are up to. So that was lovely. David Allen Pierce said, I picked up Silent Scream because you were so personable. I've never read a crime thriller, so this will be interesting. Cool interview, learned a lot. So I love that because obviously this podcast does sell a lot of non-fiction books for the guests who come on, but lovely to see that we're selling crime thrillers to new readers. Brilliant. And thanks to everyone who sent pictures this week. Just a couple. Jenny Roman sent a picture of a, um, out walking the dogs first thing this morning. Lovely leafy lane with trees and dogs. And thanks to Lisa M. Lilly, who sent me pictures from Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. She said, thought of you, so peaceful here. I'm full of new ideas for my latest mystery. I'd forgotten how wonderful travel is for that. And uh, I love Père Lachaise. So jealous, Lisa. I'm going to have to just get on a train to Paris. I've been thinking about that for a while. Although, of course, as I said before, I have to stop just doing things because I think it's all going to be over again. I need to just calm down. There will be time. So remember, you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening or you can always send me pictures of cemeteries. I always love that. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation.
So this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors, and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Kobo's author-first approach is one of the reasons they developed a promotions tool. This is an easy and affordable way for you to market your book directly to Kobo readers. They offer lots of promotions that don't require you to drop your price because they know when you publish wide, it can be a pain to coordinate pricing across multiple retailers. Any promotions listed as a percentage off, for example, a 40% VIP sale, mean you don't have to change your price as the discount will be provided by promo code at checkout. If that sounds good to you, keep an eye out for percent off promotions and buy more, save more sales where you can submit your titles and leave the rest to Kobo. And if you're taking part in a promotion, be sure to tell your readers about it. The promotions tool is updated on a weekly basis, so make sure you're taking a regular look to see what's on offer and if there's an opportunity that matches your books and marketing plans. If you're a KWL author and don't yet have access to the promotions tool, email the team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll enable it for you. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you are listening to this, and find them on social. You can create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. And I should say from a personal perspective, what I do is I have a reminder in my calendar that comes up every three weeks. Go into Kobo and apply for some promotions. Now, what I do is I just apply for everything I can. And what happens is some of them get approved, some of them don't, but I just keep on uh, applying all the time. And I also find that box sets work really well at Kobo and are really good for these percentage offs and uh, buy more, save more and all of that kind of thing. So definitely if you publish direct on KWL, make sure you get that promotions tab. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show and the extra in between episodes is sponsored by my wonderful patrons who've been, some of whom have been supporting the show for years and months. You are amazing. Truly, I know these are difficult times and I appreciate the support. Uh, No new patrons this week, but thanks to everyone who's already supporting the show. You can support the show and you'll get the extra Q&A, which I will be recording this week, where I answer your questions on writing, publishing, personal things, (laughs) book marketing, business, and of course, the futurist stuff. Uh, I answer questions on that too. You'll be able to do that if you support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T reon.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview with Derek. Derek Sivers is the author of four nonfiction books, as well as a musician, entrepreneur and book publisher. His latest book is How to Live, 27 Conflicting Answers and One Weird Conclusion. So welcome to the show, Derek. Thanks, Joanna. (laughs) I'm excited to talk to you today. So my first question is, you are a multi-passionate creator and your bio says, I'm ambitiously focused on creating. So what part does writing play in your creative life and your business these days? Hmm. Okay, well, first, I feel like I should preface this to say that your listeners should know that I'm not doing any of this for the money. Like my current cost of living is paid for by things I've done in the past. So all of the writing and everything I'm doing in relation to everything we're talking about today is is not for the money. So filter my answers accordingly. <laughs> if you're listening to this wondering, you know, how to get rich or something, I will not be giving a uh, formula for how to get rich because I'm doing this for other reasons. So what part does it play in my life? Mostly I'm just, I'm trying to better understand the world, right? Like I want to figure out life. I want to be smarter. I want to learn. I want insights into life. I want to work and live more effectively. So when I learn or invent an insight that feels useful to other people, not just me, then I feel like I should share it with the world for a few reasons. Um, I think for one is generosity. Like it would be easier to just write my thoughts in my journal and keep it to myself, but making it public can help other people. 
So it's for the greater good, right? But it also helps retention. Like I've found that writing and editing your thoughts for public consumption makes you hone and clarify every idea. And then whatever makes an idea easy to spread also makes it easier to remember, right? Like the easier it is to remember, the more likely you are to internalize it and let it guide your daily actions out in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. So I write for my own retention and I post things publicly because I find that people's feedback can improve my thinking, right? Like when I post an idea, and I say idea because I actually, I try to post things in little itty bitty bite sizes so that we can shine a spotlight on each idea. And I'd be happy to talk more about that later, but that's a tangent. Mm -hmm. But I try to post one idea at a time, right? So when I post an idea, people often reply with improvements, right? Like they, they sometimes will disagree and show me where I'm wrong, or they agree, but point out an angle that I hadn't considered. So that improves my own thinking of my own idea. Sometimes I feel like an idea is finished and I post it to the world and people go, uh, uh, and I realize it's not finished, right? So I also write publicly as an ego boost, <laughs> right? Right. And no, but absolutely. Yeah. Right? We say ego boost like it's a bad thing, but guess what? It's fuel. Like that motivation helps push you through the harder times. I don't mean hard times, like, you know, laying in a gutter drunk. I just mean like harder times, like just struggling to squeeze out an idea that's half formed and you want it. To, it takes work, right? Mm -hmm. But the ego boost of doing it, when it's done, people going, oh my God, you're amazing. Yeah. You know, like you write better if you think that many people are going to read this. So posting publicly helps you push through some of the harder aspects of thinking things through, thinking things through, whether that's creatively or even just, you know, diligent thinking through a, a life situation. And lastly, um, I think it's writing is networking for introverts. Did I get that <laughs> yeah. quote from you? I feel like that's a very Joanna thing to say. Is that? Uh, no, I don't know. I don't. Well, I mean, I think lots of people might have said that, but that sounds okay. exactly right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Network Writing is networking for introverts. Publishing your ideas instead of keeping them to yourself can help you meet other smart, thoughtful people, or at least people interested in the same things you are. So ideally, you earn respect from the people you respect. And I'd rather earn the respect of 10 people I admire than a million people I don't. So a lot of when I'm posting things publicly or my public writing, I'm really doing it for like the, the people I admire, even if they don't read it, like that's my target audience. It's like, I want mm. the people I admire to admire what I've written. I didn't, I used to feel bad about that, but then I realized like, no, that's, that's a worthy thing, you know, earning the respect of people you admire. Yeah. So for yeah, all of these pulls reasons, you on. Pulls you on. yeah, exactly. That's, it's a worthy drive, worthy goal. Yeah. So for all of these reasons, I've just pretty recently decided to take my writing more seriously. You and I met in Oxford two years ago, was it? I, well, it must've been 2019 pre-pandemic. <laughs> right. Okay. So let's say two and a half years ago, you and I met in Oxford. And I think even at that time, I wasn't too sure. Like, I think I was still, it's kind of one foot in, one foot out, right? Like I was kind of calling myself an entrepreneur programmer. And sometimes I would write and share my thoughts, but I was considering my, I was considering writing to be on the side. It was on the periphery of what I was really doing. But since then, I've just given it more thoughts. And for the reasons I just said, I've realized that it's the most worthy pursuit for me. And so t I've decided to take it more seriously, which really just means giving it more time, right? Um, yeah. Turning off other things and just doing this for a few hours each day. Yeah, I love that. And uh, it's so funny because, of course, you had this previous careers, which I will we'll have talked about before the introduction. But I came to you through your writing, through mm. Seth Godin, through anything 
thing you want I think was that Mm -hmm. that book and so that's how I came to you and so as you said sort of connecting with introverts I connected with your mind through your writing and a lot of people and that's almost how I think about it it's almost telepathy it's like this is my thoughts and it connects with you through time through space through and and we're never going to talk about all the things that we write about but it's like it's magic and I love that you mentioned ego too because I feel this is a difference because anyone not anyone but writing in your journal is one thing but we publish because we want other people to read our work and publishing is a fascinating thing and uh, you've got a really interesting publishing history because you've worked with publishing companies and then you got the rights back for anything you want I think and Mm -hmm. you are doing some really interesting stuff so what are your thoughts on publishing these days having tried different methods although I think you're pretty much unemployable by anyone else (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which yeah. probably shapes your your decisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, first, I often think in terms of what's best for the world, right? Like for the greater good. So, for example, like I think decentralization is good. Amazon should not be the only bookstore. And decentralization will always be an uphill battle. But to me, that's a battle that is worth fighting for me. For some people, they don't feel it's worth fighting. For me, I'm willing to fight the decentralization battle, right? So if you're an author that has fans, you should send your fans anywhere but Amazon. Like whether that's a small independent bookshop or selling directly, you can help be the change to help show people that there are other ways to buy books besides Amazon and Audible. So in the late 90s, there was this revolution in the music business when musicians were enabled to sell and communicate directly with their fans, which at the time, I mean, now that's a a given, but at the time in the late 90s, that was a revolution that musicians had been so screwed over by the music industry for decades that it was so empowering and liberating to bypass the music industry and just go directly from musician to fan. It just, it unleashed this huge revolution style in, uh, uh, energy, right? Mm. But here we are 25 years later and the independent spirit seems to be gone especially in the book world, to me, like any talk of how to be an independent author seems to focus mostly on how to kiss Amazon's ass. <laughs> <laughs> and that just saddens me. And so I don't take part in that. And I just, just, I defiantly, like I said, I'm willing to fight the uphill battle of decentralization. So I think it's a smarter long-term strategy to deal directly with your thousand true fans instead of blindly selling more units through some platform that captures most of the profits and doesn't let you communicate directly with your customers. When I used to run CD Baby, I would, uh, I had uh, some clients that were formerly rock stars and they told me that it would mean it meant more to them emotionally to sell a thousand albums through me, sorry, like a thousand sales, you know, a thousand CDs sold through me and get the direct contact information for their fans. Cause that's how my old company CD baby used to work. Every time you would sell something through CD baby, I'd say, Hey, here's, here's who bought your CD today. Here's Joanna Penn in Bath and here's her email address. And for each person I'd say, here's their name and email address. And the, the fans knew this too. They knew that when you bought through CD baby, that I'm going to ship you the CDs or give you the MP3s, but I'm going to put you directly in contact with the musician. And the musicians would have the direct contact information for all these fans. And these former rock stars would tell me that it was emotionally more rewarding to be in touch with 1,000 people than it was to get some kind of sales report saying that they had sold a million copies. All right, so I really took that to heart. Mm. And I really will just do everything to have direct contact with my fans or readers or whatever you want to call them. Mm. So all that being said, my first book was written as a favor to Seth Godin. I never intended to write a book. People had been asking me for years, hey, you should write a book. And I was like, no, I have no interest. I don't want to. (laughs) But then Seth Godin 
like literally called me, like my phone rang one day and it said, Seth Godin. I picked up, I said, hi, Seth. And he said, hi, Derek, I'm starting a new publishing company and I want you to be my first author. And I said, okay. <laughs> I mean, what can you say to that? But okay. Wow. Sure. Okay, Seth, whatever you say. So I wrote him a book literally in 10 days and he published it a week later. And that was my first book, Anything You Want. So he published that on his company in 2011 called Domino. And then five years later, or four years later, he sold that publishing company to Penguin. So that's why my first book is on Penguin. Mm. And I like Penguin. I mean, they're cool company. They've got a great history. And my main contact at Penguin is really sweet. We went out to dinner once. She's wonderful. I like all of the people I've encountered there. And they paid me fairly and all was well. They were even really happy with the sales of my first book. And they said they'd be happy to publish any of my future books. But I really wanted to sell directly to my fans. And it felt weird that I wasn't allowed to do that. Like I really, just in my gut, I didn't like not owning the publishing rights to my own words. <laughs> yeah. So I decided that I would self-publish all of my future books. And then, then that felt weird that it's like all my books for all future time will be self-published except that one, right? So yeah, I contacted Penguin and bought back the rights. Or I'm just in the process right now. They say it's going to be done in 10 days. Buying back the rights to my first book so that I will have the right to sell absolutely all of my books directly. Yeah, I think that answers mm. it. And I, th I think the reason was I really want to do some fun things that regular sellers can't do, right? Things that Amazon can't do. Like I really like to personalize my eBooks and audiobooks. I like to sell at a weird price. Like I have this pricing strategy that I like, even though it's weird, which is $19 for the first book, but $4 for each additional book after that. So like kind of pricing them to like share. Like a loyalty, a loyalty thing. Yeah. And I, just, I like that. It encourages people to buy 10 or 20 or 30 copies or, uh, well, anyway, I like selling my digital files for a flat $15 to say, okay, for 15 bucks, you get access to all digital formats for all future time, even formats that haven't been invented yet. You got them. You pay me 50 bucks, 15 bucks now. All digital files are yours forever. I like to sell autographed books, which is an idea I got from you. I had never considered that, but <laughs> sitting at a table on a sidewalk in Oxford, you said I should autograph them. And I think I sneered. I thought that sounded horrible, but then I thought about it and thought, okay, Joe is right. I should do that. And then uh, I like to say yes to translations. I like to own the translations. Um, but mostly, Sorry, I, I, I'm giving you very long answers to your No, no, it's great. No, it's great. But mostly the, the decision comes from thinking very long term, right? Like I, I want the rights to adapt my past books to new technologies, to do whatever I want with them for all future time. And that to me at its core was why self-publishing was just mandatory. Yeah. And I do, I prefer the, I think we both prefer the term independent publishing, because again, you, you said before, maybe the independent spirit is, is dying a bit, but I don't yeah. think it is. I think we are, and this show is definitely long-term thinking. It is wide and, and all of those things. And I, I feel like those of us who really care about what independence actually means what you're talking about is is so true what I would say though is that you are a programmer and I'm obviously I bought your books and I like I log on into yeah. your website and there's all the books I've bought and you've basically hand coded this whole thing and yep. that you know most authors are not like you <laughs> we're yep. not we're not programmers so there are tools that are emerging I mean I use payhip for ebooks and there are other things like Shopify that mm -hmm. can be used. So any tips for selling direct if people are not programmers? Just any tips really for people who might want to spin into this as well as selling on uh, the other stores? Yeah. Well, first, actually, let's, first let's just do, do the one more reason why I think it's so important to try to capture every penny you can from the sale of your book. I'm not a very money focused person, right? So I, I'm not saying this as like it, in any kind of greedy way. 
Mm. But I just think fundamentally, like morally, like if you're in direct contact with a fan who already wants to buy your book and you are already in direct contact with this person, then it seems fundamentally wrong to give Amazon a big cut of that sale, right? To go send them to Amazon to take a huge cut of that sale for somebody who's already your fan. So I have a reason for this. <laughs> it's because I, I price my digital books at $15, like I said, and I've made uh, a little over half a million dollars selling them directly to fans on my site. But if I would have sold those same books through Amazon, instead of $500,000, it would have been $100,000. Now, I give all of my profits to a charity. And the charity that I use, it's called the Against Malaria Foundation. It costs them about $2,000 to literally save a life. They have found that for every $2,000 donated, one person will not die of malaria that would have died if they were not doing what they do. So that means each $2,000 you make can save someone's life. And since I donate all my profits, that means that selling directly through my site instead of selling through Amazon means that 200 people will live instead of die <laughs> because yeah. I sold my books directly That's a good instead reason. of through Amazon. <laughs> yeah. So that to me, like, whenever I would consider like, ah, should I just, it'd be so much easier to just do KDP and be done with it. And I think, come on, even if I'm giving it all away, this is like $2,000 is a life that somebody who dies if you don't donate $2,000. So that in itself is enough of a reason to ask your fans to buy from you directly instead of on Amazon, to even tell them that that's why, if you're going to be donating your profits, just say, please. Or, or, like, or the, just, just to say, and I think that's, that's amazing, but for most of us, that $2,000 might pay the mortgage or, of course. you know, our kids' school or whatever. So what we're saying is making the money yourself is completely valid, however you choose to spend that money. And you're, you've yeah. chosen that, that direction, which is amazing, but we're not saying that you have to donate your royalties. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I was just giving all this. I think maybe I'm being a little extra defensive because I know it can sound. I've heard people just sound really greedy when they're like, why should I share? Mm. There's this core idea of why should I? It's kind of almost like those people that don't want to pay any taxes. It's like, ugh, come on. And like, <laughs> Have you not thought this through in the bigger picture? There's reasons to pay taxes. So I don't mean to sound like nobody can take any piece of my transaction. I just think like for all these reasons I've said, decentralization and all that, I just think it's like morally the right thing to do to try to keep as much of the profits from the sale of your sales directly to your fans as possible. Yeah. Okay, so that, I just had to kind of like get that off my back or whatever you call it. But okay, so tips on selling directly. That's funny, when you and I talked in Oxford, you, <laughs> I want to say tried to scare me away, but... <laughs> You kind of tried to scare me away from selling directly because of the customer support, like the tech support. You're like, Derek, Derek, you don't want to, you don't want to be answering tech support from people that don't know how to like get a file onto their phone or don't know how to like put a thing onto their Kindle. Like people, like you don't want to deal with this. You don't want to spend your life with it. And I really, I want you to know like how seriously I took your warning. I thought about that for months <laughs> and, and really considered that and yeah. really let it shape some of my decisions. Cause I, I mean, I, I look up to you a lot and you've been there, done that way more than I have. You've, you're way more experienced in this field. So I really was kind of deferring to your judgment, but I just, I decided for me, it was worth the uphill battle again. So I ended up writing a form letter telling people directly, like how to get a Mobi file onto their Kindle. Like, here's the three ways to do it. I just, you know, I took an hour and I wrote that form letter once so that anytime somebody says, Hey, just bought your book, but how do I read it on my Kindle? I just hit but you, but you, cut paste. And here is the well-written form letter telling them exactly how to do it. Same thing with people who buy my audiobook in the M4B audio for, uh, format, and they don't know how to get it to play in their phone or their tablet or their computer. I have a form letter for that that I took an hour to write. And I have this feeling that every time I'm sending somebody that form letter, I'm actually doing a little bit of greater good for the world because now this is a person that hopefully knows how to do this for future use. And one of your other listeners one day will benefit from this as that same person now feels a little bit more comfortable buying 
something directly from an author using PayPal or Gumroad or whatever it may be, right? So to me, that was like worth the uphill battle. Mm. I've been saying that phrase way too many times today. Yeah, but, no, but you're right, because selling direct is an uphill battle. It is easier yeah. to just go on KU or whatever. I, I would say that I'm sure I me- must have mentioned Book Funnel, which yes. kind of does that. But you you prefer to control all of your technology, don't you? So you actually prefer <laughs> kind of coding it that way than using a third party service. Yeah, but that's that's also just, it's kind of my favorite hobby. I really enjoy programming. Yeah, exactly. Also, I've already got a really big infrastructure. Basically, I wrote all of the software that, that built and ran CD Baby. And when I sold the company, I got to keep the backend software for my own use because I had written it myself. Like you said, every I wrote every line by hand. Mm-hmm. So I've got this amazing backend infrastructure that already has the full contact information for a quarter million people that I've emailed over the past 25 years, everybody that's ever left a comment on my site or emailed me or signed up for one of my things online, it all ties back into this one central database. So it just made sense for me to also tie in a bookstore into that same database Mm. so that I could say like, Hi, Tracy, I've noticed you've bought my first two books, but not my newest two books. Like, I know who's bought what. And it helps me talk to people to say, like, you in the past said that you really liked this post of mine, and that post of mine turned into this book. And I noticed you haven't bought the book based on this post that you said you liked. And I like I just I'm able to to communicate with people in a very personal way like that because I've kept everything in one central place. So to me, it was worth doing that. And I think the the lesson there for everyone is not that you need to hand code everything, but that long-term view, what you did with all of that is think about future. So you designed a system that could be used for the long term because you were thinking like that. That's kind of your programmer's brain, I think, kind of right. broke it down that way, which my husband's a, a programmer. And um, so I get that mindset of structuring things so you can do things in different ways. I did want to ask though, because I feel like in a way the ebook problem, it was easier than the print problem. So what about mm. selling the print books direct? Because you're also doing special hardbacks and all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah that um, luckily... One of my best friends is a paper book nerd. Her name is Saya Lee Wood, and she is brilliant. In fact, you know what? I'm going to straight up give a plug. She is really like an independent book producer now. Uh, her she's got a, her first name is Korean, uh, so it's spelled strangely. It's S A E A H. So if you go to S A E A H dot com, is Saya's website, and she took care of everything of producing my paper book. She nerds out on binding, on edge pages, on in, about the fabric, on the hard covers, about like the, the spine, all of that stuff fascinates her. And so she spent so many hours or so many months actually co- talking to so many different book printers, getting samples, printing samples with them, sending it back, saying not good enough yet. And after months and months and months of back and forth, she produced the beautiful hardcovers that you can get through me. And she has her own warehouse in North Carolina, USA, where she ships all of the books from. So she has all of my books in a big barn in on the East Coast of the US. And anybody who orders a paper book through me, it gets a little message sent to Saya to send them to where. So that's, yeah, that was worth the effort to me because I really wanted beautiful linen hardcover books. Yeah, and they're fantastic. And again, I think it's about systems, but also people. So you've found the right person to work with. Yes. And yeah. I'm I'm kind of going this way now. And also there is uh, drop shipping. You can now sell direct, but then drop ship a print on demand book, which yes. is, and this is kind of the first, I think this is really emerging now. So you can still sell direct, but you don't have to have a warehouse full. And of course the upfront printing cost is often a problem. So this is what yeah. I'm looking at now is, okay, I can sell direct print and drop ship at the same time which is just fantastic yeah. so yes. I know I think I mean time moves on and these problems companies emerge and people emerge to solve these problems don't they because they're in people want to do this so when people yeah. want to do something the answer emerges somehow yeah yeah I agree and, yeah. and sometimes it's worth doing a step backwards like the 
So I ended up just doing a good old fashioned, like upfront printing 20,000 copies of my hardcover book, because I just kind of estimated that's how much I think I'll sell. I had to just kind of guess, which I know the, the more efficient thing would have been to just do them all print on demand. But I just found that I could get a higher, higher quality by doing this certain kind of, I forget what it's called. It's like not digital printing, but uh, uh, off, offset printing. Offset. Like? Thank you. That's the word. Yeah. So they're offset instead of computer printed or instead of digital. And it was a slightly higher quality. And to me, that was just worth the upfront investment. So I had to take an, a gamble and yeah, pay them whatever that was like uh, a few dollars per book for 20,000 copies up front and um, uh, warehouse them and all that stuff. So a lot of people might not want to do that or might not care so much about the, the nerding out on the paper quality and font quality and things like that. But I love that you've done that because again, I guess you're known as the sort of digital guy, but you, you also now have these wonderful print books that, that your company's done. So I want to um, come back to, you mentioned earlier, decentralization is good. And looking at what the music industry, what's happening in the music industry now, we've got interesting decentralized, if one could call them that, um, options with blockchain and mm. NFTs to split royalties. And then we've got Changes like Spotify getting into audiobooks, and there's, there's a lot happening right now in, I think, in the music and audio space that is we're starting to see emerge for authors. Like the royalty fractionalization thing is very, very interesting to to me and many authors about wow this is kind of potentially the future of crowdfunding and that there's lots Mm. of options so what do you think about some of these emerging um, opportunities and and challenges? Uh, Great question. I can't emphasize this enough that nobody knows the future so focus on what doesn't change. So I've been in the music business since 1987. (laughs) I've seen a ton of change since that time. And what I've seen in music is this, that people always love a memorable melody, but you can't know what instrumentation or production style will be in fashion. So it's best to focus on the craft of making great melodies. And people will always want an emotional connection. Right. But you can't know which technology will carry that communication that will create an emotional connection with somebody. Like the technology that carries it from one place to another will always change. But the emotional connection is always the real point. So I think it's best to focus the core of your efforts on the essence of how to connect with an audience. And writing lots of songs increases your chances of writing a hit. And even within a songwriter's career, you can't know which song will be a hit. It's often a surprise. Like songwriters are very often surprised which of their songs ends up becoming a hit. Like if you read almost any interview with songwriters, the song that became a hit was a little thing that they slapped off in five minutes, whereas the songs that they worked so hard on that they believed in the most didn't hit, right? So Mm the best strategy is to write as many songs as you can, right? So the core idea here is that instead of trying to predict the future, you should focus your time and energy on the fundamentals. The the unpredictable changes around them are really just the details, I think. So the best investment of your time is always on the timeless aspects of your craft. And I think that even though it's newsworthy to talk about NFT stuff and blockchain and whatever is going on right now, that's, it's interesting to the media because it's new. I think that it's actually driving a minority of the sales, right? Like I think the majority of the sales you're ever going to get will come from the fundamental aspects of what you're doing. How great is your story? (laughs) How memorable are your characters? How insightful is your writing? And yes, there's activity on the ever trendy fringe of things. And it might be worth it a bit of your effort, but I'd say to proportion it kind of appropriately small, but all of that being said, I think whatever fascinates you, you should go do it. And if it doesn't fascinate you, that's kind of what I'm speaking to. If somebody's listening to this feeling like, ugh, 
blockchain NFTs. Ugh. <laughs> It, it's just, I guess I should be doing this, but I don't want to. No, then I guess that's who I'm speaking to. It's like, if this doesn't fascinate you, then you could just skip it. Like, it doesn't matter that much. It's the edge of things. And and some people are fascinated by it. And if you're fascinated for it with it, then go for it. But I really think that the most strategic use of your time is to focus on the fundamentals that don't change. Mm, no, and I totally agree with you. And also most people listening will be rolling their eyes at me asking that question because I am fascinated with it. And But yeah. I, I guess I'm thinking about business models of writing. I've 15 years now I've been in publishing, not as long as you've been in music, but um, writing and publishing for 15 years. And again, how the business model has changed in 15 years is kind of crazy. And so I'm looking at another 15 years ahead and thinking, what is my yeah. business model going to look like in the next 15 years into right. my 60s? I guess how can I position yeah. myself so that I'm ready and and I'm 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 often early in in adopting new ways of publishing so and I think the smart contracts that are emerging with NFTs are really really interesting for the future of intellectual property so I guess that coming back to what you said earlier which is you want when you sell direct you're going to make sure you include the formats of the future but the problem at the moment is that authors are signing contracts that have a clause in that say something like all formats existing now and to be created mm. for the life of copyright authors yep. are signing that and they are essentially it means they can't take advantage of a new opportunity. And I'm completely yeah. with you. Like right now is not the time to do NFT books uh, as we mm -hmm. record this in April, 2022, but maybe by 2025, if it's now the new thing, the thing yeah. that we're doing, if you've signed a contract, that means you can't do it, then you're going to be screwed. So I guess that's yeah. what I'm thinking of is yes, it's edge case now, but what if? Yeah. And that's a great argument to, keep your own rights now, even if it means that you're giving up some sales. By the way, I do just feel that, you know, I, I should give some kind of caveat that everything I'm saying, I realize is just one point of view. And I could <laughs> no, that's argue an interview, against Derek, we know that. It. <laughs> right. That like, no, but, but also what I'm saying is two of my friends are Mark Manson and James Clear. Well, three of my friends, Tim Ferriss, <laughs> Mark Manson, Jim Clear. I mean, a few of my good friends have gone against everything I've said here and done astonishingly well, selling bajillions of books. Mark Manson going... just did the NFT drop as well, didn't he? Yeah. And, yeah. and all of this stuff. It's just, and so everything I'm describing is just like, this is, you're asking me to talk about the way that I've personally chosen to do it, but I know that it's not the way for everybody. I'm not prescribing it to everybody, but like for my temperament, my situation in life, you know, even like the, the very first thing that I started out saying, like, I'm not doing any of this for the money. If, if I was to say, what's the best way to make a ton of money selling books? Well, then I wouldn't say you should be hand coding your own website and, and all that. But, <laughs> but yes, I do think that trying as much as possible to hold on to your own rights, even if it means losing some sales in the present, is a smarter long-term strategy for the future of whatever's happening next. Mm, absolutely. So just staying on the technology side of things, I think we talked about AI translation when uh, we, mm -hmm. we talked in Oxford. And I'm really fascinated with GPT-3 and GPT-4 is due out this year and, and the kind of tools that we can potentially use for as writers with AI. So I wondered, what are your thoughts on how creatives can work with AI rather than fight against it as we move into as a tool rather than a it will write a book for me type? Of thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now this technology interested me. So actually, I looked deeply into blockchain and NFTs. And as a programmer, I nerded out on them for like two weeks and then decided, like, eh, it doesn't interest me that much. But GPT 3, I also really nerded out on. Uh, I contacted the company that makes it, OpenAI. OpenAI, yeah. And I got an account with them. And so now I have an API account so I can do anything I want using GPT-3. And so I wrote some programs to use their API. And then even then I was, got interested enough that I uh, paid like a consultant that was a hardcore expert of GPT-3 in particular. And I worked with him for two weeks to help 
understand it even better. He showed me how to do even more than I realized was possible. And yet, after all that, I can say that I know it quite well. I don't think it's a threat at all. Like, I think nobody listening to this show should feel that that GPT anything or AI anything is going to be taking your job away from you or, you know, it's never going to be your competition. I shouldn't say never. Um, but I found that, so GPT-3 can wonderfully complete a sentence for you. It can complete a paragraph for you, but more words was never the point, right? To be a great writer, we need more insights, more emotional connection. We need more wow, not more words. So I found that you can use GPT-3 to finish sentences when you don't know how to finish it. This was one of my favorite usages of it, is when I was still, what do you call that, ideating, when I was mm. coming up with ideas, when I wasn't quite sure how to complete a thought, like I had the beginning of a thought, but I was like, mm, I don't know where to take this. I would plug it into GPT-3 and I'd say, give me 20 different answers, sorry, give me 20 different endings to this sentence or this paragraph. And I'd say, go, and it would return 20 different replies. And I would read through them for inspiration. And most of them were worthless, but occasionally I would get an idea from GPT-3's strange completion of my sentence, right? But it's not that different from asking strangers on the street, right? Like, how would you finish this thought? Um, because ideas can come from anywhere, right? Like you can get an idea from a song or an advertisement on a bus or a overheard snippet of conversation. So you can get great ideas from GPT-3's auto-generated stuff. So I would highly recommend it for that. If you can get an account with GPT-3 or find some way to use their API to let it complete your sentences or paragraphs that you are stuck on, it's wonderful. But I think, in, yeah, anyone listening to your show has nothing to fear from it. It could replace people that were churning out, or it already has replaced people that were churning out crap fodder to fill search engine results. But those people do not listen to this show. <laughs> Hopefully not. No. And also marketing copy. Jasper, I think, is now using that to to put out marketing and, and add text and things like that, which is an interesting use case. Just before yeah. we talk about the translation, on GPT-3, people listening, I've had Armit from PseudoWrite, and PseudoWrite is like a front end on GPT-3. So again, mm. to use the API, you have to be quite technical, but pseudo right is like a front end. And I feel when you said strange, I was like, that's exactly right. I feel that that my pseudo right is like a strange co-pilot that comes up mm. with things that actually make me laugh sometimes. I'm like, that is mm -hmm. just ridiculous. But the, I, I, I don't laugh when I'm, well, sometimes I do sitting on my own writing, but mainly right. it's like, wow, this is, it just comes up with stuff that makes me think in a different way. It's like, so, mm -hmm. it's, I know it's not a mind, but it comes up with things that, uh, that ha are like different than what I would have come up with. And that's yeah. why I like to use it too. But I completely agree with you. It's a massively powerful tool, but you have to drive it. You have to prompt it. Yeah. And that's the key, right? You're, it doesn't just do it on its own. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it very, for, when I first heard of it, I was more excited for its potential. And then as I actually used it, I thought, oh, okay, this isn't, this isn't as interesting as I thought. I do, you know, sorry, we didn't even talk about translation at all, but I think... For translation, it's amazing. And I think that's a perfect use because that is something where it's, there can be something close to a right answer. What was the, the Picasso quote? Computers are boring. They can only give you answers. <laughs> and I like that a lot. So I think translation is a wonderful use of it, at least for the first draft. So what I've done for a lot of my books is uh, I have this new service I created, or once again, me making my own tools, I created something called inchword.com that I've been using. It's basically just my tools I've been using to translate my books. And I break down all of my books into per sentence. So every single sentence has its own entry in the database, and then they get merged together into the, the template to make the layout of the article or the book. And so I used a service called deepl.com to translate each one of those sentences at a time and return to me the translated sentence. And then I would store the translated sentence in the database 
But then I would always hire a human translator to use that as their starting point and improve it from there. And they just found that it saved them some time that say like a quarter of the time deepl.com returned a translated sentence that they felt was good enough as is like, okay, that's fine as is. So I could just leave that one and then they can focus on tweaking the ones that could be better. So I love that use of AI. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And again, tools that we can use to achieve our creative goal. That's, I yeah. think, what it comes down to. So on your now page, I want to just look forward uh, now. You say that How to Live is your best book ever. And I, I love that. I love that you're so proud of it. And I do. you were writing it when we spoke in Oxford. Mm-hmm. And I, I remember then you were like, this is the challenge. And But your face was sort of light up when you talked about it. And so uh, you say after four years, it's done. And it's clearly been special and challenging. But yeah. I know that you you don't necessarily sit around going, hey, look at my amazing book <laughs> and I'm done. Hmm. Like I'm finished now. That's perfect. <laughs> so uh, w- what are you doing next? What are you excited about creating next? Or are you just going to rest on your laurels for a while? Yeah. Well, it's funny. The So sorry, uh, listeners, I'm not trying to sell you my book, but just saying that How to Live is my book that I think a lot of new parents I've heard have this feeling like when they have a kid, they think, God, I I really want to put like everything I've ever learned into a book for my kids. So if I die before my kid is old enough, I can, somebody can just give them this book and I can say, this is everything I ever would have told you. So how to live, my book called how to live is kind of like that. I, I compressed kind of everything I've ever learned into one book. And the first draft of it was like 1300 pages. And then my challenge is I spent the next two years editing it down to only 114 pages. Uh, And I did that by reducing almost everything down to a single sentence, right? Like each idea was reduced to its essence in a single sentence. But then the problem is I wrote this 114 page book that feels like I've now said everything I have to say (laughs) on earth, right? So even though I haven't, because most of my ideas are just represented with this single sentence, it's put me into a weird position where everything I think of saying now, it feels like, like, oh, but I already talked about that in How to Live, but I did it in only a sentence, but I already did it. So here's what I'm thinking. Stand-up comedians usually reuse their old material and slowly introduce some new material, but they keep the old laughs uh, as they keep touring. So if you go see them over the years, you'll hear them tell a lot of the same jokes, but some new ones. But just a few of the most brilliant stand-up comedians challenge themselves to come up with all new material every year. It's a massive challenge, and only a few have ever done it. Um, But I want to challenge myself now to say, okay, well, I just put everything I know into how to live. So I'm kind of starting from scratch now. It's time for me to generate new thoughts, lateral thinking, discovery, learning more, sharing more. Um, Not just new material for books, you know, the book is not the point. It's really more about new insights into life to say, okay, well, that's everything I've learned before how to live got put into my book called How to Live. And now everything I do next will only be the stuff that I learn after that. So it's really about challenging myself to, to learn more. Um, mm, and and didn't more. you just say that you're now hard in a hardcore reading phase? You yeah. That on your uh, blog? yeah. Well, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say hardcore as much as I kind of stopped reading for a few years of how to live because of the nature of that book where I was putting everything I'd learned into one book. So it's like, I don't want to learn something new right now. Otherwise I'm going to have to add it to the book. The book's already long enough. So I I had kind of stopped reading for a few years. So now I'm reading this backlog. I've got like 120 books queued up on my Kindle, books that I'd bought from the last few years, but hadn't read yet. So I'm reading them all now. I'm putting aside a few hours a day to just to reading. Mm. And I think that, I mean, that to me is the way to get excited about the the next thing. Um, I've been listening to, we talked about it on the show. It's a book called The Genesis Machine by, mm. uh, I know you don't want book recommendations, but it's no. about synthetic biology. Now I have no background in biology and this book is, it's a nonfiction book, but it's like science fiction because it's a topic I know nothing about. And I'm listening to it going, oh my goodness, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's amazing. Mm, <laughs> and it's I so funny. And it's just like, wow, that just sets off all these fireworks. And that's kind of, 
I don't know, that's how I feel when I'm excited about a topic. It's like fireworks in my brain. And then you never yes. know how it's going to pop up again, right? So I imagine yeah. that's kind of where you're going is where do the fireworks come up next for me? Yes. Yeah. I actually just last night started reading the essays and aphorisms of Arnold Schopenhauer, oh. uh, this German philosopher that I've heard of for years, never read his stuff. And I'm only like 10 pages in and I'm like, oh, ooh, this is good. <laughs> ooh. And today I'm still thinking about the th 10 pages I read last night. So yeah, uh, as for what's next to me, yeah, my challenge is to learn a lot more. So I will have more insights into life and maybe have something new to share with the world. Brilliant. So where can people find you and your books and your blog and everything you do online? Oh, just go to Amazon. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, no, um, uh, my website is sive.rs. It's my last name, but with a dot in it. So yeah, sive.rs is my website and everything's there. And really, honestly, part of the reason that I do interviews like this, instead of you and I just, you know, talking at a cafe, is for the, I really like the kind of people that listen to your show. So if you're somebody that listened all the way to the end of this interview, my email address is in a big font on my website. Just send me an email and say hello and introduce yourself. I actually really, really, really love meeting other writers, especially from around the world. It's like, I mean, you know, there's a reason you're doing this podcast too. It's like <laughs> meeting other writers, you have so much in common. It's such a great kindred feeling to, to talk about writing with people. So oh, indeed. Yeah. any other writers, please send me an email, say hello, let's connect. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Derek. That was great. Thanks, Joanna. So I hope you found the interview with Derek interesting and I highly recommend you follow his blog for interesting thoughts on different things. Also check out his store and his books and try his buying direct process, which I think is fantastic. And again, obviously, we're not expecting you to code your own. There are plenty of options uh, and services to help you. But I also want to prove Derek wrong when he said the independent spirit seems to be gone, especially in the book world. No, we don't want that to happen. We want to bring it back. And as ever, this show focuses on wide publishing, multiple streams of income, and I have always sold direct. Since 2009, I have been selling direct. But I want to go even further into it and more to come on that for me. And I hope our discussion inspired you too. So next week, it's back to the writing craft when I talk to Matt Bird about the secrets of character. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.